Hi, it's Sam Laidlow, professional pole dancer, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. Sam Laidlow, what a treat. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks a lot for having me, mate. It's, um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit late to jump on this podcast. Um, Kona was a bit a bit mad, but um, you're definitely uh, definitely on my to-do list. Uh, there's been some great, you've had some great hosts, and um, it's a privilege to be here. Oh, look, Sam, uh, yeah, I mean, off the back of uh, that breakthrough Ironman uh, podium uh, where you had the whole triathlon world on their seat, including me, it was just riveting. Now, I've been around the sport since I was 10, and it was just probably the most memorable Kona I can recall. It was just unbelievable. I had friends messaging me that weren't into triathlon, you know, that were loosely into triathlon, but not into it. And uh, just like, Are you, can you see what's happening here? I'm like, yeah, you know, we, I wouldn't have picked you to be uh, destroying the field. Uh, you know, it's just, mate, uh, it opened so many eyes. So congratulations. And since then, uh, it's been a, probably an Ironman uh, effort in and of itself to keep up with some of the media commitments and, and no doubt, you know, the, the interest that's come your way. Yeah. Um, I guess I was, I was ready for success, but not what, not for what came after it. Um, if you can call that success. I mean, for me, it, def- it definitely was, um, yeah, it's just been not so much media commitments that have been bad, but just, uh, just trying to make the right decisions, you know, trying to have a bit of perspective on, because suddenly basically everybody wants a bit of me. Uh, and it's like, I haven't yet learned to say no almost. And, uh, so I was just basically saying yes to everybody. And then I would, I would finish the day and be like completely empty, you know? And, uh, yeah, it was quite, quite different from that. I had a very simple, I, I think what's got me to where I am is I have a very simple life. I live in this tiny medieval village in the South of France and just trained with my dad in the garage, you know, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it got, it got me to, to like a world stage. And then suddenly I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite ready for it, but, um, no, I feel like I've, I've dealt with it well. And I really feel like now it's, um, I feel like I have to be like a man rather than before I was just a boy, you know, because I've learned so many new skills and just whether it's, I don't know, negotiating contracts or dealing with lawyers or this or that, or there's so many things that have made me realize that actually, like I used to think it was just swimming, biking and running. And, uh, yeah, I've come to realize it's uh, a bit more complicated than that. The, the fourth leg of management, managing the uh, success, the brand, the, uh, yeah, everything I, Vincent Louis said, uh, earlier in the year, I thought it was brilliant. I have three, three brands, my, my, uh, my looks, my money and my, and my brains. <laughs> I was yeah, like, yeah. I was yeah, like, yeah. it was very clever. Yeah, no, Vincent is, is definitely, I mean, at the national level, he's, uh, in France, I mean, he's who you need to look up to, you know, he's done it all very, very well. And, um, yeah, his management's great. Um, I know his manager and I've been lucky enough. So after Kona, I had about four or five, I was in discussion with four or five managers and, uh, yeah, uh, I decided to work with, uh, with Ronnie Schlidnek, who also works with Sebi Keenly and, uh, in the super league and with the HEP, HEP global team. So, um, yeah, he, he knows his stuff and, uh, He's really excited for the for the adventure, but um, actually, he was almost the only manager who didn't come towards me. It was almost, it just kind of happened naturally at the at the at the after party um, in Kona. We just got talking, and because to be honest, I didn't I didn't even know he was a manager. So um, yeah, but I definitely I definitely need one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And actually, yeah, it's just I'm. Um, it's well, the weird thing with triathlon is that compared to other sports, and I was talking about this with some pro cyclists um, out on the, the Breitling trip that we had in South Africa. Um, like a cyclist will basically get paid, I don't know, let's say a 300k contract to ride his bike all year. And he's effectively an employee of, of the company. And he just, he just focuses on doing his job. And for a triathlete, it's almost the opposite. We're almost like the the head of a, of a company, you know, like the CEO. And then because we're employing, I don't know, I might employ at the moment I'm employing my mum to help me with my, like the financial aspect. Like I'm going to employ my girlfriend to help me on marketing and digital marketing and all that. Uh, my dad for coaching manager. And then you've got, so you're, you're basically, uh, you've got your company. And then on top of that, you're trying to train 30 hours a week. So um, it is a challenge, <laughs> but I think it definitely develops uh, a big skill set. And it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting uh, when I'm only 23. Yeah. Yeah, gosh, I think it's, it's it's easy to lose perspective on just how young you are, Sam. Uh, and I mean, it's easy to also forget that your debut Ironman was at the start of this year, 2022, uh, in St. George. Uh, and then you, oh, sorry, your first Ironman World Championships, my yeah. correction, was uh, St. George. Yeah. And then, you know, what, however many months later, you, you're on the start line for your second World Championship and picking up a, 
you know, a barnstorming silver medal, uh, just been obviously run down there at the very end by by Gustav Eden. And, and and what a day. I mean, it was a record setting day. I'm a huge fan of people taking it out hard on the bike and your bike leg was just I can't remember a a, a better bike leg in any triathlon. That was just unbelievable. Four oh three. Four oh three, the new bike course record. Is that 4 4? No, I think. 4 4. Sorry. You'll take another minute off. <laughs> You'll have that. <laughs> 4 0 4. And in your watt average, I mean, I think it was 311 watts that I saw somewhere. Yeah, closer to 320. It was, I think it said Sorry, on Strava about 315. Um, yep. With like, but there's a, that's counting the moments where you put your shoes on at the start. Towards the end, I like start to stretch. You know, I'm not really pedaling towards the end. So yep. I would say I think the normalized was maybe closer to 325, 330, but yeah, around about 320. Um, so yeah, that was definitely, that was definitely towards the top end of what I can do. But, um, what was more noticeable was that there was no drop off. Normally I kind of always set off at that kind of wattage and it just fades in the last hour. And, um, I don't know if it was, I think it was a mix of a few things. We had a quite a strong head, uh, tailwind pushing us back towards the end. And, um, and then also I was just racing on the emo- racing on emotions, you know, when you're leading the world championships, you don't really, you don't really feel <laughs> like thinking there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it just, everything came together. I, I knew, um, it's funny actually, cause I, I remember after the Collins cup, uh, my humiliating defeat at the Collins cup, um, I, the PTO sent a camera crew to do this documentary and I never even realized that I was looking back at it, but I said something like, I feel like I'm on the cusp of doing something but I've just never had, had, had the opportunity or I've never done it, you know? And, uh, so there was obviously clearly numbers and stuff in training that led, led us to believe that I could do much better than I was. Cause, um, yeah, I'd never, I'd never won nine man. I never won a 70.3, you know, I'd always, I'd, I'd led a lot of races, but, um, I'd always blown up and yeah, if there was one moment to not blow up, it was, it was this race basically. And you ran a PB off the bike, 244, uh, you know, I was waiting for what I thought might have been a, a bonk that was going to come after a bike course record. You know, you, you took minutes off the likes of Camworth, uh, and and you just didn't. You kept going and going and going. And as the further you went and the further you held off Christian and uh, and yeah. uh, good stuff, the more the world got behind you. It's like wow, like yeah. this is the real deal. <laughs> it was a real deal yeah. performance. No, it was, uh, and actually, yeah, I didn't. I, I kept exactly the same pace. It was just Gustav that he suddenly like dropped three or four Ks at like 320 pace and uh, yeah, and closed the gap like that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, um, from my performance aspect, the only bit where I could have like done better on a day was, was the swim. Um, I, I should never come out of the swim with Gustav and, and Christian. I should be swimming at least three or four minutes faster than them. Um, I mean, most of the, even the 70.3s that we've done, I've generally put about that time into them. Um, and I just think it was kind of a strategic error. I, we had a current coming in and I, I decided to go hard on the way out and not, and then kind of ease, ease on the way back in. But the problem is it was so, the tide was kind of pushing us together. Um, so I just couldn't get the gap that I needed. And by the time we got to turn around, I was kind of a bit spent because I'd done all the work and, uh, Florin Anger came past and then I just kind of sat in and turned, I did a bit, a few strokes backstroke and realized that everybody was there. And then I just realized that, yeah, I thought to myself, God, this is going to be a long day because um, previously in St. George, I think I came off the bike with maybe a six or seven minute lead over Christian on the bike, uh, uh, off the bike. And um, he he caught me up before the half marathon, you know, so that was uh, that was. Yeah, I was de- I definitely had that in mind. Um but equally the best races I've ever had often the start has always been terrible. Um, I remember my, my first breakthrough race when I was like a junior, I won a European cup and like the moment I dived in, I got like completely smashed goggles came off and everything. And I was like dead last basically. And I was thought, and I really distinctively remember thinking, Oh, I'm going to quit like right now. And then that was the, I eventually, I think I was number 27 or 28. So I really wasn't expected to win this race. And in the end I won this junior European cup and it, and it was, so yeah, often when I have a bad start, things go, go well. And when it, when it, when I have a good start or like a good <laughs> swim and a good bike, generally things don't go quite so well for me. So, um, yeah, I still think I can, I've got a, a better race in me and, uh, I hope to show that when, when we go back to Kona in a few years. Yeah. I mean, we can't not go there now. I mean, it's a, been a controversial couple of weeks in the Ironman triathlon world with yeah. Ironman announcing that it doesn't look like the men will be racing in Kona in 2023, but speculation around Nice, uh, you posted up a, 
you know, a post to sort of, uh, you know, encourage commentary and uh, just thoughts on it. But what are your current thoughts, uh, Sam? I mean, obviously you'd want to be uh, in if Kona. I, if, I, if I'm looking at it from a, like from a performance aspect and a CV aspect, I, I'm not really, I'm not too fussed because I feel like Nice will suit me more than Kona. Um, and from a marketing perspective, it's in it's a home home country event, so that's their positives. Um, I think the course is tough if it isn't Nice, and so it will mean that um, there's a lot less drafting. I mean, even this year in Kona, there's still some big big packs and guys that are, are racing well, and I don't feel are racing well like honestly. Um, and yeah, so from that aspect, I, I, I'm not too fussed, but I just think it's it's just terrible for the sport. You know, I feel like the I feel like the Ironman business has got is so far away from the Ironman sporting event. You know, now it's like they're just they're too detached and they don't realise and they don't really care what what their public think. And I think that's um, it's, it's a big issue. Yeah, I mean, long term. And uh, yeah, I, I think it is a great opportunity for the PTO, for instance, to just like dive in, maybe organise a race in on a different island in Hawaii or, or something. You know, um, uh, so yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't think it's going to change much. They seem pretty decided, um, but I just know long term it's not. It's not good for. I, I mean, it's, I literally I've received hundreds of messages, messages, and I haven't seen a single person who's who's for this decision. You know, it's just so many couples that have like, I don't know, who want to make it their their thing to go together. You know, even if it's just one racing, but they still want to all go together. And they might, I don't know, they might not be able to because one's racing here, one's racing there, one's qualified here, and so many people that have already qualified for. Kona already booked their tickets and yeah I just I just think it's it's a mess really and I think what I particularly dislike is the fact that they're blaming it on making the women's event bigger you know but personally I don't <laughs> if they just want to make the women's event bigger then just like swap it and put the women's event on the Saturday and our race on the Thursday or just yeah but this I could argue for hours but I'm not sure it'll change anything <laughs> yeah I think it's it seems easy to see it as a bit of a PR spin that they're looking to, you know, as you say, a headline and profile the women, but you can do that and still have men on the island. Surely. Uh, mm. I had a, uh, a known brand uh, founder in the, he popped in post past Pogo Physio today where we record this podcast, Sam, and he, he sponsors many of the athletes and he said his challenge is going to be if it's in split locations, they want to be there to support both the females and the males. Um, yeah. What do they do? Like, you know, do they, what do they do if they're so, I think ge- geographically it's, you know, it could be quite nice to see the sport potentially evolve, but I think splitting up the the gender is just, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, quite confronting. Yeah. The problem is, is that oh, clearly there's more and more money in triathlon, which is a good thing as a professional, but um, it, it, what's happening is similar to you see in, in the world cups or it's just like whatever, whatever nation or sorry, whatever city or country pays the most is that's where the events are being held, you know, but we're kind of losing the authenticity of, of the sport itself. And um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, I may, maybe it'll work out and, but yeah, no comment. Yeah. No, I'd like, absolutely not. Like I respect that. Uh, it's a, it's a tricky position for you to be in. Uh, Sam, before we sort of move off Kona and, and, and explore your beginnings, uh, three sort of themes. Uh, the first is, your confidence. The thing that struck me watching your performance is I watched the Collins Cup. I watched some of the lead up races and they clearly weren't your days. Uh, and no. I know racing, you kind of feel as good as your last performance. You know, you carry it over and your confidence level rises or falls on that prior performance. Um, all right. Yeah, I think it was Collins Cup where, you know, you had some GI upsets or some challenges, cramps that might have been yeah. in your walk in. How did you spin that around to, to go in and have such confidence led into the, the Ironman World Championships just months later? Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd been training super well uh, leading into the Collins Cup. I'd done a training camp with Daniel Backergaard up in up in Farmo. Um, and uh, yeah, I was hitting some good numbers. I was really confident in my ability. Um, and then I think I think what, what happened in the Collins Cup is that I was the only person who saw it as... as I was trying to make triathlon entertaining, you know, I don't, uh, I, I think it can be boring. And like <laughs> in, in my head, it's like, I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, how come so many like millions of people watch MMA yet? Like nobody does it. You know, I feel like lots of people do triathlon already, but yet nobody watches it. So <laughs> I was just like, it, it, I, don't, I can't wrap my head around that. And I think, I feel if everybody 
kind of played the game a little bit more, it could quite easily be more interesting, you know, just, I mean, just a couple of years back, I remember when Cam Worth did this one video of Talbot Cox and just talking a little bit of shit about other athletes, like it blew up and everybody loved it, you know? And um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just felt like that's what the, that's what the sport needed. And um, yeah, so I think that's what happened is that I didn't take it too seriously, even the defeat itself, you know, this, this Collins cup is a race where we get paid to show up. So yeah. I don't feel it's a, I don't feel it's necessarily a, a, a rate. Like, I don't know. It's for me, it's a show, you know, and, it, and, I, and you see that because next year they've actually, they're going to do it at the end of the season, which I think makes much more sense. So everybody can just show up and yeah, I mean, you can start pissed if you want and you're, <laughs> you can, uh, it's um, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely a bit of motivation, but equally I knew I, I knew I trained well leading up to it. Um, and yeah, there was uh, the actual day of the Collins Cup. So many things just didn't work in my favour. I mean, these, uh, yeah, I don't want to accuse anything, but these these guys like Lionel and, and Sam Long, they had a they had a lot of motor help com compared to me. I mean, I, I I saw their numbers. Uh, sorry, I saw Lionel's numbers. I saw my numbers, and I don't know. Some things just didn't add up for me. And then on top of that, I just had yeah terrible terrible GI issues. But um, yeah, and then I guess I just moved on to the next race. Didn't really, uh, it affected my family quite badly because they all came to watch me in the Collins Cup. And um, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I don't think I, my uh, people who know me know that I'm not arrogant, you know, I'm, I'm confident. But this race, I clearly just came across as arrogant because, yeah, I complete what I was talking about. Was complete. I mean, I, I said things like I'm not made from the same cloth as Sam Long, and then he fucking. I mean, I was right. He basically annihilated me, you know. So um, yeah, <laughs> I it didn't cross great. I understand, but I also got a lot of messages after Kona saying, "Oh, I wasn't too sure about you at first, and uh, but now it all played out. But um, equally, I think they're like the part the partners that I am deciding to work with and, and all that. They, they, yeah, I think they people who like me really like me and people who dislike me, well, they can dislike me. And I, I'd rather that, you know, I'd rather that than just kind of, if you get asked, oh, what do you think about Sam Laidlow? Just kind of somebody sitting on the fence, you know? <laughs> well, so, um, I mean, yeah, I think it's brilliant. You remind me a little bit of like Macca, you know, putting a bit of energy and interest into it. And, you know, the Collins cap words, you know, words, but, how it was portrayed between yourself and, and Sam Long, it generated interest. I wanted to watch it to see across the line first. So, you know, yeah. it, it does generate interest. Um, did Sam message you after the, uh, after the Ironman world champs? Uh, yeah, he did actually. He also put a public, he also put me a big face, my big face in his Instagram story actually. So, um, yeah, we'd, we'd already kind of made up at the at Dallas. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I had nothing against him, you know, I was literally just a bit of banter and there's yeah, British humor and sarcasm. And I know that, I know that it's a thing in Australia and it's a thing in <laughs> other countries, but yeah, the UK like a bit of sarcasm. And I guess in America, it's, it, they can, they can be quite serious and not necessarily get it, but um, no, I, I, I respect Sam and he's a, he's a great athlete and um, yeah, we'll just move on. But I just think it's a shame because we could have, we could have built a real rivalry, you know, that could have like gone on for ages and every time people would have watched it. Um, <laughs> and instead we've kind, of, we've kind of spoiled that, which, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I mean, uh, there'll be, there'll be plenty more, plenty more times you guys take to the line together. So Sam, uh, confidence, you, you turn the ship around. You said you came out of the swim and you weren't having a, you know, you felt like you'd made a bit of a tactical error in Kona. Was your mindset in a negative state after the swim or were you still quite forward thinking? And did you, and in this ties into expectations, like, did you honestly expect a podium finish in Kona 2022? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't expect I didn't expect to cut. Well, it's difficult to say. Um, the thing is in St. George, I came eighth, but I was extremely unfit and just came out of COVID. So I kind of knew that something was doable with, with much better fitness. Um, about three or four weeks prior, we'd done PTO Dallas and it was super hot in Dallas. Um, and I kind of, I really felt like I could keep going for ages. You know, I, I, I finished fourth, though, so just behind Sam Long again. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, this time, like everybody was just crumbling at the end. And it, and I, I felt and like everybody was diving straight into these ice baths and stuff. And I really felt like I could, I could have just kept going for like double the amount of time. I couldn't push it any faster, but I could, I could go. So then I had a bit of confidence and my training was going well. And just, like, I felt healthy. My HRV was, was great. I mean, it was like the, and even when I went to Kona, then the two weeks that I spent there, just every day I was waking up and, and the training was going so well. I felt like there was no adaptation really to the, to the heat, maybe going to Dallas already where it was even hotter than, 
in Kona. Um, but no, I mean, I, I was e- I was equally in this kind of mindset, which could expect any everything because I, I'm Pete, there's so many stories of people going to Kona with high expectations and getting completely obliterated. So I was like, yeah, I was confident in my ability, but I wasn't expecting anything or results. I mean, in my head, I knew I could go under eight hours, which which I guess is a quite quite confident because there's a, there'd only been four guys in the in the history of the sport that'd been under under eight hours. Um, but the only problem is I didn't I didn't know that ten guys would suddenly ten more guys would suddenly <laughs> go under eight hours this year. And uh, yeah, I think um, the sport's definitely hit a new level, and it's and it's great to see. You. Yeah, absolutely brilliant, Sam. Uh, and training leading leading into uh, Kona. You know, fueling, curious on your fueling strategies and also the actual workload. Uh, you know, what was some of the peak hours that you're putting in leading into it weekly? Uh, weekly, I'd probably be uh, not not huge. I'm, I'm going to open my training picks now, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I wouldn't go over, I don't know, probably our biggest week was maybe 26 hours because it was quite difficult because we had Dallas and then we were kind of traveling. And But I, I'm not I'm not a big trainer anyway i i i guess my workload is quite high like my tss like will be quite high because i like if i train i train you know i don't go and i rarely go and cycle at like 200 watts you know uh, i mean i'm I, I if i if i cycle i'll i'll cycle at my proper like zone two which for me is like 280 watts you know so if that's already quite quite a so demanding an actual like workload like the pure uh, energy that's going out is quite high, but my hours aren't that high. So I would say I'm definitely more quality focused than I am quantity. Mm. Um, that being said, when, when people say, Oh, I, I'm much bigger into quality than I am quantity. People associate that with like high intensity, but I do pretty much zero high intensity. Um, I had some, some gut issues, like, um, like, a per, like a gut permeability issues. And one of the symptoms, well, one of the things to get it to heal better was to do more like no anaerobic efforts, um and that so I, I did this kind of this was maybe like 18 months ago and this was one of the breakthroughs that helped me in my performance was getting my gut healthy and um so one of the things was yeah taking digestive enzymes and then another thing was also uh not doing any anaerobic work and like for eight weeks basically like an eight week really strict protocol of not eating gluten not eating raw veg and blah 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 um and uh and just to get my gut healthy again so i could actually absorb the training um and yeah i feel like that's something that a lot of people suffer from in in endurance sport um i was lucky enough to come across well i didn't come across him it was me who who employed him but i so i only live an hour away from Girona, and i knew that i knew that yarn was working with a, a doctor in Girona. um and i mean yarn is is the king of comebacks you know from injuries and, and all sorts um and so I, I went to see him and said listen i i feel like there's something not quite right in in my in, in my body, you know, I don't feel like I, cause what was happening was I would wake up one morning after a rest day and feel completely tired, you know, because actually the tiredness was coming from some food that I've eaten, you know, I just wasn't, it was creating inflammation and I couldn't, I couldn't train properly. So, um, once I got that sorted, I definitely made a, a huge, huge difference to me. And, uh, yeah, and actually gut health is often overlooked, but I think some people, um, yeah, uh, I feel that some people can massively benefit from it because at the end of the day, if your gut's not healthy, like you can't keep up with the workload of, of training. But sorry, I've deviated a bit. Um. <laughs> no, that's that's really interesting, Sam. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think fueling's so easily overlooked. Uh, I work in as a sports physiotherapist, and yeah. in the endurance capacity, I, I think still one of the greatest challenges athletes face is making sure they have enough energy available to you know absorb the workload and 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 have their bodies bodies uh stay healthy uh so what you just mentioned there about gut permeability issues uh and, and people having challenges i know dan plues recently said that the number one reason people don't finish an iron man is probably not surprising it is gi issues uh yeah. and you know he pointed out that there's often a bit of a race for carbohydrate ingestion each hour, you know, how many grams per hour yet on average, yeah. most people's guts can't tolerate more than about 60 grams. So anything else we take yeah, in yeah. surplus can just sit in the stomach and not, and that is the problem. Um, so yeah, it depends. And one of the reasons why these, these Norwegian guys are so good is that they've taught their gut to take on like a stupid amount of carbohydrates, you know? And, uh, and I, I think, I, I don't know, this is maybe just a theory, but I, I feel like this 60 gram rule is kind of, 
kind of false fake news because fake news. Like, lots of people sit down and eat a plate of rice or a plate of pasta which is way more than 60 grams of carbohydrate and it ne- like loads of people don't have issues with eating that plate of pasta or that pizza or, and so I, I would find it very weird that why would we naturally eat in one sitting way more than we can absorb in an hour you know obviously i get i get the fact that when you're training and stuff like there's less blood in the stomach so there is a, there is that aspect of it but um there, there's there's part 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 of it is getting your gut healthy i think first uh and then secondly is what carbohydrates you're putting in you know if you're just like sticking in if you're just like eating only dates well then you're just like your fructose ratio is going to be way too high and then you probably are going to have like uh, gut issues and i just think people don't look into it enough you know people i know a lot of pros and a lot of pros who are training maybe 30 hours a week you know or more and they don't like they'll spend they'll spend a load of time like focusing on gaining this half a percent somewhere but they're not necessarily looking at the limiting factor of their performance you know so if your limiting factor is your gut then I don't know, spend 30 hours a week sorting the gut out and then, and then start training. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so obvious when you say it like that, but uh, yeah, brilliant. So uh, anything you need to do ongoing for you, you, you know, your gut permeability now or that's, that's sorted and you're just, uh, I'm just yeah, I'm, I'm careful with it. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't get on super well with grains, so like cereal and but I, it's almost like a natural feeling. I can naturally feel it's just random stuff like uh, red peppers also seem to upset my stomach. So it's more just like listening to your body, um, but it is, it's much, much better now. And um, yeah, I was also working with a nutritionist and uh, based in Ireland. And um, yeah, but we just kind of it, also these things take time. You know, it's like um, I think my I don't know. I, my doctor was saying that it's like the um, onion principle or something where you take the layers off and like finally find the the problem at the the core. You know, you just keep eliminating like uh, I don't we what do we call it. We say um, like leave no stone on the uh, pebble. I can't remember what the the freaking yeah, quote leave, is. <laughs> leave no stone unturned. <laughs> exactly that <laughs> that's uh, good job. you can turn it into a pebble sam i think you could uh you could make that trendier mate uh yeah. and sam uh, i think the last question just on kona uh you posted a beautiful post on uh on your gallery on instagram it's pinned to the top but everyone was waiting for it you know would good stuff catch you eden that is obviously the, the 2022 i'm in uh kona world champion would he catch you and when he did there was that moment uh everyone loved it uh, sports fans it was just a, a symbolic moment you ran past you you gave an exchange fist pump high five sort of yeah. uh, and and then you know everyone was asking you what did he say you, you posted up for those that have asked here's what gustav said i'm proud of you so that's uh i mean that's some fighting spirit and serious respect out there with circa how many k's to go was that at that point it was, it was not many i think it was about six six or seven k's to go yeah seven yeah. k's to go which I don't know when you think about another race like like when I, I was the same I was thinking about this a couple of days I was, I was like like holding Blumenfeld off of 7k's is a bloody long time like that <laughs> if, I, <laughs> if I was to get that like just be put in a situation where I've got a two, like a one minute 30 lead on Blumenfeld and hold it off I'm, I don't think I would um, so yeah I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of that um, but yeah I just in the moment I, I definitely wasn't thinking oh this is this is an iconic moment if I it was just really natural and um, yeah also back in the Collins Cup Gustav was kind of really supportive of me you know like he so what happened was I think he was two waves behind me in the Collins Cup and he overtook me and we and I finished with him but he kind of said oh just come on and like finish with me and I and I ran with him for the last 3k or something and that really it really opened my eyes because I was like wait a minute I can actually run at this pace you know I mean yeah but admittedly I had like I'd had gone into the bushes like four times to have a shit. So I was fine. <laughs> but, um, I, I just, so when, and that was in the back of my mind as well. I was like, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I've, I've stayed with him in a Collins cup so I can do this now. And there's, there's this brief moment in the live stream where you see me kind of like follow him. And then I'm, and then like my mind just really wants to, my body's just like, no, don't be stupid. <laughs> the, thing in, the thing is in Kona is it's such a fine line between overheating or not. And you, you really notice that when you get these big bottles of ice, of iced water and you pour it over yourself and for like for two and a half minutes, you feel like a new man and you're just like <laughs> running much faster again. And it's, um, yeah, I just had to, I just had to keep a cap on it basically. And, um, yeah, make it to the end. Yeah. And I mean, it's a fulfillment of a childhood dream. And I think many people in the sport would know, but perhaps outside the sport wouldn't that you'd been dreaming of this since you were a boy. Uh, what was your first yeah. recollection of triathlon as a kid? I remember mine, I was in, who was here in Australia in the nineties, turned on the TV and there was Brad Bevan and the domestic, you know, televised TV series. And it was instant love. If you like, I was like, wow, I want to do that. 
Um, what was yeah. your first uh, moment of watching triathlon uh, or being exposed to it, Sam? Of watching, I've had a few. Well, first of all, I, I participated in my first when I was four uh, up in up in near Foramo, up in the lake in Les Angles, uh, where lots of athletes go and train and where Joel Fiol's group goes and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I did my first triathlon was when I was four, which is, so that was almost before, like I was so young that I can't really even remember it. You know, I've been there, so I know the location and stuff, but I was so young that I can't even remember doing my first triathlon. Um, and then I particularly remember Jan winning the, the Olympics in, well, sorry, no, I already, yeah, I, I remember the Olympics in 20, in 2008 in Beijing. Um, I remember Alistair just like leading, leading the run, you know, this young, this young kid full of <laughs> confidence that just went out of the front and, until he, until he blow, blew up, you know, and uh, that's always the, how I felt as well. Like, I just want to, I've always felt like I need to see what is, see what you have to do to win. And in order to do that, well, I just need to stay at the front until I can't no more, you know, and uh, I think that's just an, an instinctive uh, thing in me that I'll, I'll always keep. But um, I remember because we, it was like 5k into the race and uh, we were all watching it, my mum, my dad, and my mum said, oh, I think when you'll, you'll grow up, you'll be more like Fredino. And like, I don't know if you remember, but Jan wasn't at all the favourite for this race. Like nah. he, like, I mean, he was, he was good, but nobody expected him to win. And so, and then he won, then he won the bloody Olympics and then kind of, I never really thought about it. And then he starts moving to long course and starts becoming and whip, like winning the world champs and so I was like, Ashley, like, yeah, I, 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 I could do with being like him. That's not too bad. <laughs> and uh, it's, and it, it's funny because now, like, I'm signing, well, yeah, I don't know when this is going to be released, but it look, it's, look like, it's looking like I'm going to sign with a lot of Jan's brands um, because they kind of see the next Jan Fredino in me. And and uh, I don't I don't totally agree with it. I think um, I'm a lot less clinical than he is. Um, I'm also, I, I don't look as lean as he is. And, um, yeah, but... Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a good person to be compared to. And, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm truly honored. And I actually finally got to meet him for the first time. Well, I raced him briefly in Gran Canaria a few years ago, but I finally got to meet him about two weeks ago in South Africa. Uh, we had a trip with, with Breitling. Um, and yeah, it was, it was great. Well, I thought, uh, he was at the finish line somewhere around there at Kona. This year. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd already met him just like yeah, not yeah. to talk to like, and go for a ride with. And, but it's, yeah, it's, um, it's it's a weird it's a weird vibe between between Jan and me because I can see I can still see like the pure athlete who just wants to win and Jan's very good at like he's got this this aura about him you know where he wants to make you feel like he can beat you at any time you know and uh, <laughs> we, we were in South Africa and in this in this private <laughs> private as well in this huge villa and it had a private wine cave and we were tasting expensive wines and he just um, I said something like, um, and this was like four hours, four hours deep into into an evening, and I said something. I, I thought like we'd gone away from triathlon, or, or like gone away from serious talk, you know. And I said, "Oh, what's your plans for next year?" And he straight away said, "I'm going to come and beat your ass in Kona." And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> <laughs> this this guy is is dead serious, you know." And uh, yeah, I think that's what makes him so good, and that's what's truly amazing about Jan is that I I, I generally don't feel he's the most talented guy yet. He's as fast as go at the sport at the moment, which is which is amazing. And you said you let you feel you're less clinical than Jan. What do you mean by that, Sam? I'm just a bit more brash, you know. I mean, if I go for a party, I'll go and party hard. Um, <laughs> I mean, he probably has, I'm sure, when he was my age. But um, <laughs> yeah, and you know, it feels like when Jan races, everything is fought through. You know, it's super super tactical. And yeah, he does race at the front, but it's just like me. I, I like I'm the kind of guy who just throw my power meter off and just like go for it and. Um, yeah, we're we're slightly different in that sense, but equally that's what that's what makes me me. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be the next Jan Fredino. You know, I, I want to be me. And yeah, I'm not I'm not at all. Also, I find it kind of, I don't I don't think I can be compared to Fredino. You know, because I'm never going to win the Olympics, and I'm I'm not even sure if I'll win Ironman three times. You know, that's not necessarily my goal. I want to win Kona definitely once, um, but I, I don't know what I want after. Well, sorry, I know I know what I have visions in my head, but it's not for me. It's not just about performance. I want to be. I want to be remembered in the sport, you know, for, for other things, just being a good human and being able to give back. And I don't know, so many, so many other things. I also want to explore my creative side and which I, I don't feel I've had the opportunity to do yet. So I don't know at the moment, my target's Kona, but once I've hit that, I'll probably go and do something completely different. Hopefully link the two together with triathlon, but yeah, we'll see. Creative side. Uh, as, I mean, looking from the outside in, you do strike me as, 
cut from a different cloth to many of your contemporaries. You know, your interest in there's an edg- edginess about you. You know, you're kind of a little bit unexpected. What's Sam going to pull out of his sleeve next? Uh, so I think I think you already do stand out as a bit different in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 when I say explore my creative side, I generally mean explore explore it because I, I haven't got a clue. I feel like so my my mum comes from like the art industry and textile and design, and but I it's just something in in my education in France that I've never got to discover because I was so quickly like put into into sport and I was so obsessed with that. But um, yeah, I, I eventually I don't know want to create my brand, my image, you know, and maybe maybe relate that to sport and somehow I, I don't know. I also feel I've always felt that. Um, it's funny because high level sport, it, it comes across as really selfish in a way because, and it, and it feels selfish at times because everything you're trying to motivate people into your project, you know, and people tag along and, and it's great because I can motivate people, but it's always about me, you know, and I, I even feel bad for my little brother because in the household, it's like, oh, or even he goes to school and people say, oh, it's amazing what your brother's done and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I, all that to say that I feel that once I get to a certain level, um, like basically triathlon is just my canvas. And then like, once I get to a certain level, you know, I want to be able to to give back, you know, whether it was, I mean, I was just born into triathlon, but whatever, whatever it was, I, I would have always found a way to get big enough and to then have, I don't know, the budget or the opportunity or the voice and the platform to, to basically give back and hopefully put more kids in situations like I had, you know, I was, well, for me, I'm not saying triathlon specifically, but if they want to become, I don't know if they want to become a, an astronaut, then finding a way of the, the, for this kid to become an astronaut. You know, I just think that it's kind of frowned upon nowadays in society to dream and do whatever you want. I think like people get put into boxes, you know, like, oh, you have to, you have to become a lawyer. You have to do this. We have to, do, and I'm, this, I haven't got anything against a lawyer as long as that guy really wants to become a lawyer, you know, really wants to be a lawyer. But um, I just feel we naturally get put into boxes and yeah, hopefully somehow, still still unclear in my head but i'll I'll find a way of of getting that voice across uh mate we'll watch this space uh sam i mean you grew up with triathlon like your father richard who's your current obviously coach and there was that great moment at the end of kona where you're both very emotional and and that's the heart of sport i mean it's moving for anyone to watch it's just a pure outpouring of really a, a dream since you're a boy and years of as you say your dad been in the garage with you in recent times, plotting how to take down the the Norwegian train. Uh, but you, you grew up around it uh, with an age group. Uh, I think, I believe your dad, father was Richard was coaching age groupers having camps. And so it's, it's, yeah. it's really been with you since you're a boy, which I think makes it all more, all the more special. Yeah, it was, um, you know, my dad's pretty inexpressive and I've never, I've never seen him cry. You know, I've won some races, won some Ironmans, like non-branded Ironmans and stuff. And never, he's never shed a tear. You know, it's like very, he would give me a hug and I don't know, like say I'm proud of you, but this was the first time I saw him cry. Um, and yeah, it's, um, wow. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that was difficult for me is not having my mum and, and my brother because they, they play as big a role as, as my dad does. Um, we're very, we're very close family and that's, that's what's, that's what's my strength at the end of the day. And that's the only thing that, separates me from any other athlete you know or any other story i guess um and i think that's also one of my one probably my biggest strength is being able to keep my family together you know i've got i've got a so i yeah if i was to be asked like what is my biggest strength i would say perspective because i have this kind of weird sense of looking at myself from above and knowing that like i don't know i can so i'm not going to have a row with my dad because i don't i don't want it to it's like I, I can kind of take a step back and think oh this is stupid you know i'm not gonna I'm not going to marry a girl who lives in, I don't know, Paris and move away and live there because at the moment my strength is my family and like I, I need to build around that, you know, and I need to grow around that and make sure that they're happy because that's what makes me happy. And, that, and then that generally just having a good balance is what makes you perform well. And yeah, I've always had this ability to kind of take a step back and make decisions uh, with a bit of perspective, which I think is, yeah, what I'm most proud of, I'd say. That's uh, so interesting. I think you just broke the hearts of many Parisian girls there, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, uh, you, uh, we call this obviously the theme this show, the highs, lows and learnings. Uh, I'm going to push you for top three tri- uh, time trial tips. Your bike leg in Kona was brilliant, beautiful to watch. Just a, an exhibition of time trialing uh, beauty. Yeah. Uh, what are Sam Laidlow's top three time trialing tips? Um, 
So what, the first one is maybe a bit controversial, but I would say don't just go into a bike fitter and listen to like what he says. I mean, I, I know some good bike fitters out there and, and like full credit to, to their work, but it's just, I've always found um, that like whatever you feel comfortable in and whatever you feel is fastest, that's probably what is going to be fastest. Um, I mean, you may know or not, but I, like, I got my bike, I got a brand new bike size seven days before Kona and completely changed everything. So like I, the position I had in, in Kona, um, it's just like, it was a position I'd had in my head, but I'd never got the opportunity to, to do it. Cause I, I didn't have like, uh, so the, the Trek mechanic had made me these extra long bars and I managed to put basically like put all my reach as far forward as possible. And kind of rather than being like really when my hips closed, I kind of all pushed it forward and. So I would say whatever you feel comfortable, you often see people that try and imitate another position uh, or they, they'll they see, I don't know, high hands and go and do that. Or So whatever you feel is comfortable, just like you tweak your bike until it feels good. I think that's really important. Um, secondly is like definitely focus on, I think I've, I've heard Cam Worth say this before, and but I knew, I knew this tip way before his tips. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> um, learn to, learn to ride the road. You know, the, the goal is to ride fast. It's not to put as much power out as possible. It's if anything, it's the opposite. So, um, just like, especially in Kona, it's, um, like the road is really rolling. And so there's lots of moments where you can gain speed and kind of keep momentum. And I think that's something that people completely, forget about you know sometimes it might be worth pushing them extra 50 watts if it means you're getting over the hill at a much higher speed and then keeping that momentum going um so that's i think one thing that helped me um uh and then the third thing would be um of yeah it sounds it sounds a bit normal i guess but i would say just like nutrition hydration um in ironman especially i mean i wouldn't I had like four liters on my bike, you know, because I have such a high sweat rate. So, um, and at every single aid station I had to force myself to drink 500 mil. Um, so I would like, don't worry about the extra weight that's on your bike, you know, because you, yes, it might, might be down by, I don't know, like half a kilo or kilos or three Watts or whatever you want to call it, but at least you risk like not completely blowing up. So, um, yeah, there would be my three tips. Yeah. Brilliant. So Sam Laidlow's top three TT tips. One, don't forget to go with what feels comfortable uh, with your bike setup, uh, bike fit. To learn to ride the road, which I grew up doing road racing, cycling for my yeah. triathlon, and I just think it, it teaches you so much. And I've heard you mention to Greg Bennett that you were the same. Three, nutrition, hydration. Don't be afraid to take on extra weight as long as to ensure yeah. that you're, you're, you're doing that side of things well. Yeah. And then we can all expect bike records in Kona. <laughs> <laughs> and if I was to add a fourth one, it would to be get to get a TT suit that fits you because like there's a lot to be had. There's a lot to be had in the material, you know. And actually, I saw Vincent Louis winning Daytona with these baggy arms, and I was like, "Damn!" <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't well, follow Vincent Louis, Louis style tips. <laughs> <laughs> he's, one most, he's one of the stylish guys in, in the sport so apart from, <laughs> yeah. apart from the baggy sleeves on his tri suit <laughs> oh gosh the, the fourth one make sure you get a TT suit that fits you uh, Sam uh, let's jump into some uh, rapid fire questions which we've been rolling with for seven years so we can't let you out of this performance round here they come training session most disliked I would say a speed track workout, like a VO2 workout, because my my yeah my speed is inexistent when it comes to running. Training session most loved, just like an epic long ride, like 250k. Just go out and ideally with two or three other guys that completely blow up. Because that kind <laughs> of I kind of, I kind of thrive off of people bonking for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite pre-race meal? What fueled you in Kona? Um, mashed potato, vegetables, and chicken. Mashed potato, vegetable, and chicken. Sam Laidlow's bedtime morning time routine. What's that typically look like? Um, head in the morning. <laughs> what was it? What was that? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I think I think I know what you said. And I was. Oh, we're, we're rolling. <laughs> we're rolling with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> head and coffee in the morning um and in the evening i would go now i i have this big issue which i hate to read but i need to force myself to read more so just like no screen time uh, i generally don't go to bed too late I'll, I'll be in bed at 10 10 30 max 
Um, yeah, I'll I'll watch a series. I like I like a bit of um, I like a bit of like cooking competition. So anything like Master Chef or Master Chef the Professionals or Great British Bake Off or all them things are, are, I really love. <laughs> so I'll, I'll watch one of them and then and go to sleep. Uh, and what morning routine is? Yeah, I mean I said it already. Uh, if you have if you have a girlfriend, then, <laughs> then, you know what, then you know what to do, and then have a coffee. <laughs> Well, I mean, I talk about regularly uh, in my work as a sports physio uh, when it comes to minimizing the risk of bone stress injuries. We have a little funny maxim for the guys because they tend to remember it, and that is a boner a day keeps the bone stress away. And, you know, it's, it's well touted that if you're not waking up with five erections uh, as a young virile male that's doing I'm, oh, sorry, endurance training a week, then you are possibly exactly. under recovered or under fueled. So, sounds like, Sam, yeah. you've got those two uh, categories well covered. <laughs> Yes. I mean, but I'm slightly worried because I know, I, I know a few athletes that have had some stress fractures and now I'm questioning their, their sexual life. <laughs> Sam, who's the athlete you most admire and why? Um, Muhammad Ali. And the reason? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I have to say why. Um, just because he was, he's one of the them athletes who was just bigger than the sport itself, you know, and that's why, I, I mean, I, 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 I doubt I'll, 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 I'll obtain Ali's reputation but I would like to always be bigger than the sport itself like bigger than triathlon because I feel it's quite a small pool of people relatively on the world scene um and yeah he was just I mean he did things that were, that went way bigger than that so that's way bigger than boxing so that's why I, I admire with him yeah yeah brilliant toughest competitor Sam Laidlow's ever raced who's that and why toughest i would probably say i'd say the toughest competitor is probably blumenfeld he's just so tough he this guy just like will suffer he just like loves to suffer and uh yeah i mean i, I even saw this picture of him uh, on the weekend doing this the 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 run leg in bahrain and it was just like he was you could just see he just enjoys it and i'm and i'm i'm adamant that if this guy if the world went to an end and like you just asked him to have, for him to have two things he would just have food and a turbo trainer in a small box and he could just suffer <laughs> and eat and he would be it'd be completely content with that that's uh it's funny you said that i i saw that 68 minute half that he ran in, in bahrain and i i thought you know for these guys it's kind of a you know it's a it's not a competitive race right it's a it's yeah. a it's an appearance race and yeah. Of course, and I just thought, wow! Yet he's still determined to probably have a faster split than Vincent in the uh, in the yeah. individual race. Uh, I remember at Super League in Mallorca when I was there for the physiotherapy side of things. Sam, I I said to to Mal in Malta, sorry, to uh, Christian waiting for a bus. Have you got a girlfriend? And Christian's response with no hesitation was, "No, I just have my pain cave." And I just thought that was just brilliant. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But he um. I got, I got, I got asked in, I think by the PTO or something to describe, to describe athletes. I think it was the Collins Cup, describe athletes in one word. And they said Blumenfeld. And I said, I said, Mark Zuckerberg, because if for me, like the Zuckerberg of triathlon, you know, this guy, he's just, his, his balance, like we all need different balance to be good. And his, it requires very little. We just training and suffering and eating. And then he's, it, the guy's content and that's what makes him so good. Yeah, fascinating. At nearly out of the performance round, Sam, few few final uh, quick fires to go here. Is there a mantra that you use when you race and compete? Some regular self talk. If yes, what is it? Uh, there is none, though. <laughs> Sorry. No, easy. <laughs> best, re best recovery tip, Sam? Definitely eat well. Uh, like, not just eat enough, but eat healthily. Um, and. And, and, and just being, just being happy. I think that makes you recover much faster, I reckon, than stressing over some, some stuff or some situation you don't want to be in. So yeah, being content and just having a good balance, I think. That's uh, I was going to ask you your top three fueling tips, but I think you might've covered them off there. Eat enough, eat healthy, be happy. <sighs> kind of powerful. Yeah. <laughs> one word, here's that one word. Uh, you prefaced this before, but one word to describe Sam, La Sam Laidlow's racing style. Oof, uh, aggressive, I guess. Yeah, yeah, aggressive. Makes sense. How would you, <laughs> Sam, describe being in the zone? Uh, I, I feel like um, in training or in, in racing. I, I, in, in training, I kind of feel in the in the zone when you're just like in the middle of nowhere and three hours deep, and you feel like I don't know. You feel much. I don't know. In a way, you feel much smaller. Like you realize how I don't know. It sounds weird, but when you're in the middle of the mountains or somewhere, and you realize how small you are that's when you feel like you're in the zone, you know, like the, I don't know, you see mountains around you and they're much bigger and the weather, I don't know, it's terrible. And you're just such a small, 
like spit of a person on 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 the globe you know i think that's what feels for me like i'm in the zone um and then when i'm racing as i said before i really get a i really get this buzz off knowing that other people are suffering you know and kind of just yeah the, the more i can inflict pain on others for some reason that really gets me going the more you can inflict pain on others the more it gets you going that's uh that's fascinating Sam, final uh, question in the performance. Oh, actually, no. When was the last time you were in the zone racing? Was it Kona? Probably your last race was Kona. Yeah, def- definitely Kona, yeah. Kona, I was I was in the zone, especially on the bike, just in that kind of flow state where yeah. everything was just going well, you know, no niggles, nutrition was on point, and I was just like, I didn't want it to end, really. Wow, wow. And, and your effort level, did you feel like you were exerting a high effort level, or was it? disproportionate to what um, the performance is actually I felt like I was exerting a high level right at the start to, to get away because I had to overtake like 20 guys and, and, and kind of make the break happen um, and then once we hit the turnaround and I was actually expecting it to get hard from then that's when I really felt kind of more and more comfortable and, and as I said I just almost didn't want it to end yeah brilliant last question performance round we know that epic sessions alone don't make champions uh, as per Stephen Silas teachings but what's the hardest session you can recall ever doing Sam um i've done a decent one swimming uh which would be like 50 100s going on 115 um yeah and then uh running uh, in, yeah uh, there was a period where i was doing getting up to these like almost 30k trap sessions and, and they were pretty pretty hard um but yeah i would probably say that that swimming one yeah yeah, 51s on 115. You're out of the performance round, Sam. Final few questions here. Uh, we ask every guest to issue a physical challenge for the week. So this can be anything. It can be entry level. can be related to your morning time routine. What is okay, Sam, Sam Lodlow's physical challenge to the listeners going to be? I've got one. Um, Should we so be worried? People, people won't be able to see this because um, – because they're not, they won't see the video. Well, but there will be the video episode on YouTube. So here we go. Oh, you, should have, you should have told me that I would have put a nice top on. <laughs> so I, would put, I would have put a sponsor's top on. Um, you get your towel like this, and then like every morning, you go to your bathroom and do your shoulder mobility work like that. See, that's pretty impressive because that's really narrow. <laughs> you can do that, you can do that so, 10 times, yeah. 20 times. And then you'll be, a, you'll be a much better swimmer. So uh, Sam Laidlow's shoulder mobility challenge. Yep. And we will uh we'll put that little video up on YouTube, Sam. Sorry, on uh, <laughs> on, on the social channel with with we'll uh, overlay your sponsors on top. Sam, uh if you could boil everything you've learned to date into one piece of advice to help listeners of this show perform at their physical best, what would that solitary piece of advice be from Sam Laidlow? Just be patient, I guess. Um people aren't yeah, I've uh, this is another quote that's not mine, but it's like people overestimate what they can do in in a month and underestimate what they can do in a year or 10 years or, or a lifetime. So I would say, yeah, be patient. Be patient. So powerful. Uh, I mean, I often talk to athletes coming out of injury, like don't look at the next season, look at your next three, you know, like it's, it's just yeah. hard to get that perspective. Where do you get such good perspective as a 23 year old? I mean, in, in life scheme, Sam, you're a baby. <laughs> I don't know. I, I generally, I generally don't know, but yeah, people have told me that I'm a, uh, an old soul in a, in a young body or something which is which is good yeah and I've always felt like I can learn from older people from an, from an early age I've been so we organize these camps and we always eat with and I've met, and met so many people from across the world and so I've always listened to I've always taken advice from older people and um, because yeah I feel like they've lived and probably know more I guess and um, yeah it's quite a nice situation at the moment so I, I still live with my with my parents and I generally feel like I make them a bit younger in a good sense and that they make me a bit wiser in a good sense so it's a nice mix as well yeah wow powerful and an interesting insight and i guess yeah sitting around the dinner table with all the uh as a junior with uh, all these people coming and going from the camps and in the in the, the the triathlon coaching business uh yeah you probably did have to sort of mature up to uh be able to hold a conversation yeah 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 fascinating sam you said that triathlon is your canvas for now What's the next painting that Sam Laidlow may may may, uh, may paint? What's it going to look like? <laughs> um, I'm in this phase now where like I want to learn to win. I really want to. So I've, I've I've never won anything. You know, this is my my issue. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna call a meeting with my dad and everybody and just say, listen, from now on, I want to. 
I want to win, you know, and do whatever's whatever's needed to win, uh, at least for the next two or three years. Um, so I feel like I can commit. I can commit for that right now. Um, and then, and then see, yeah, definitely. I want to, I want to find a way of giving back. I want to grow my image, have a, explore my creative side and, and all that. Yeah. It's, it's a bit unclear my canvas and I'm sorry. No, that's absolutely, it's a work in progress, uh, acting your way into a feeling as yeah. it all rolls out, Sam. Uh, what I'd like final question here, like you're a real learner, you're a thinker. What's, if you had to summarize what you've learned about yourself this year, you know, from eighth, eighth at the start of the year in St. George in the Ironman World Championships, the races in the middle of the year, and then this incredible performance in the, the year. What's what's the one thing you've learned about yourself that you didn't didn't know before? I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to that quote that's actually Greg Bennett uses in his um in his podcast, which is like su- success comes to those who endure that one moment longer. You know, I really feel like it was I was I've been on the cusp of something for a long, long time, and like now the the curve has been exponential you know it's been it's it's, it's like I, if i would have at the start so at the start of at the end of last year and the start of this year i started off with three ironman dnfs you know for various reasons and like i was relatively like so like i was like i was a rock bottom really if you think about it like you do you go to three ironmans and you dnf them all and like why the hell would you even think about winning kona you know and sometimes if you just go that, that one more day believing in your dream you know sometimes it can just happen and it, i think it's the, like it, people yeah it, yeah it's, it's never linear you know it really is just trying keeping at it and being patient one one day more yeah that's so powerful isn't it sam laidlow congratulations on the you know the break for a year that you have had uh, we all look forward to following your journey you're you're a, a fascinating character to follow uh, if you're not following Sam on Instagram, do yourself a favor, uh, jump over there. Thank you for stopping by the Physical Performance Show. No, pleasure, Brad. I'll speak to you once I've won Kona. We'll hold or you to that. At least. All right. <laughs> <laughs>